Hey, what's up, folks? I'm Colin, one of your cafe coordinators, and we're back with another Teen Science Cafe live stream. Now, before we start with the stream, be sure to take a second, go down, and click that big red subscribe button, and make sure you never miss another awesome North Carolina Museum of Natural Science video. Remember to be respectful in the chat as our moderators will be keeping an eye on the comment thread. Please put your questions in there for us along the way. Also check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Tonight we've got an exciting guest for you. Our guest works as a recreation program specialist over outdoor programs for the City of Suffolk Parks and Recreation Department. She received her undergraduate degree in biology from Virginia State University in 2007. She then worked as a, as a wildlife graduate research assistant for Virginia Tech for three years, studying bog tur turtles' reproductive and nesting ecology. She has a passion for diversifying the outdoors and getting people of all backgrounds to engage with nature. Please welcome Keisha Bridgers. There we go. Hello, everyone. I'm Keisha. Um, I am an outdoor program specialist, and I work with the city of Suffolk in Virginia. Um, I thank all of you for being here. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I do, um, what my journey has been, and how or why I enjoy the work that I do. Sorry, kind of new to Zoom. So for my undergraduate, um, I went to a historically black college and university. I went to Virginia State University where I studied biology pre-med. Um, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Um, I graduated at the top of my class. I was number two for biology and I was in the honors program. While at Virginia State University, I ended up doing two internships. Um, during my first internship, I studied at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, um, where I studied breast cancer cells. Um, and this research was supported by the National Institute of Health. Then for the next two summers, I worked in southeastern Arizona at the Appleton Wattel Research Ranch. And this research was supported by the Audubon Society. During this research, I studied the bunch grass lizard, which is this small guy over here um, with the orange stripes and blue stripes beneath it. Um, it's a threatened species. And I also studied the Mexican garter snake. This experience pretty much changed my life. Um, I never knew that you could do research in an outdoor setting. Um, and I used the same math and science skills that I used in a lab. Um, we spent a lot of time hiking. Um, we had to camp out at our research sites. And then the scenery changed for me every day. Um, I worked in grasslands. Um, I worked in mountaintops, saw all kinds of cool animals. Right here is the great horned lizard. I have, oh, this was my study species right here, the bunch grass lizard. And we did certain things like took their measurements of their body size. So this had me thinking, you know, do I really wanna go to medical school? Do I really wanna be in an enclosed environment, a very sterile environment? I was really drawn to the outdoors. And so after those experiences, I pretty much said, how do I change this? Um, I thought I needed to go to school for animal behavior. So I started taking as many um, behavioral classes that I could take. And then I ended up going to a graduate school fair where I saw Clemson University was there represented and they had a major called wildlife science. And I was like, wildlife science, what is that? So I just ticked it off and submitted that I was interested. I ended up getting a phone call from Clemson um, asking me what I like to come out to their campus. And Clemson, they did it right. They took great care of me. They flew me out. 
They put me in a hotel and they connected me with the Black Student Association. Um, at the time, I didn't see um, how there was any differences in who I was and what I wanted to study. So remember, I went to a historically Black college. I went to Clemson and I was surrounded by the Black Student Association. But Virginia Tech found out that I was interested in wildlife and I ended up getting recruited by Tech. Um, I loved Clemson, but something told me, actually it was a little birdie, um, a bird flew into the window and for whatever reason, it gave me comfort um, and I made a decision to go to Virginia Tech. Um, at the time, Tech was considered to be the top three in fisheries and wildlife sciences. So I felt like it was a good place to go. They, off they also offered me a good scholarship to attend. And then they were just doing the most awesome research. Um, they studied aquatics, which was going on over here. They looked at soil samples. We did habitat restoration. There was bat studies going on, bears, trees. I had never seen anything like this while I was in school. And so I found the work to be very exciting. Um, I love graduate school for that reason, because graduate school pretty much prepares you for what you're going to do in life. So after deciding to go to tech, my research study or my research subject was the bog turtle, which is the smallest and rarest turtle in North America. It's about three and a half inches in size. Um, I was interested in knowing their reproductive and nesting ecology. Uh, so in order to do this, I was familiar with some of the research methods, like taking their body measurements and things like that. But I wanted to see, could I use ultrasound to figure out when turtles became gravid? Gravid also basically means pregnant for us. Um, and so I used ultrasound. That's what's going on in this image. And with the ultrasound seen in this image, Basically, I was able to detect that turtles became gravid four weeks prior to what we could pick up on x-ray. X-ray could only determine whether a turtle was gravid because of the shell cal calcification. And so this was my, my research team. Um, I did really well in graduate school and I ended up becoming nationally, nationally recognized by the National Science Foundation. And I received a graduate research fellowship that paid for, it gave me a stipend to go to school for 30,000 a year. And then any school that I went to got 10,000 a year for me attending that school. And then $1,500 towards international travel. I was just blown, I didn't know you know, that I could achieve something as prestigious as this, you know, basically getting paid to go to school. And then um, just to give you a little bit of the statistics, over usually over 10,000 people yeah. apply each year and they only hand out about 2,000 awards. So even though I enjoyed the work, I realized that I was really struggling um, I went from a historically black university to now a predominantly white institution. For the first time in my entire life, I was 21 years old, I walked into a classroom where there was nobody that looked like me. You know, I did research around others where nobody looked like me, no professors, no nothing. I was the only black person in the College of Natural Resources. And so because of that, um, I went through a period of depression. You know, I didn't feel like I could really connect to anyone. Um, I noticed when I showed up in certain spaces, you know, I would get a lot of questions about, you know, what was I doing there? So uh, I had to do some soul searching and I had to ask myself, am I capable? And really I was capable, you know, I always did well in school, you know, and I was, I received this award. Um, and I ended up reaching out to my mentor and he told me, he said, well, turn this into something positive, you know, stay with the program, just get through your last year and what can you do to make it more enjoyable? And so I took that and I ended up creating three internships um, for students of color. And I also joined the diversity committee for the college and became orientation chair 
for new students that came into the school. And it really did make a difference. Let me go back real quick. So when you're studying turtle populations and working with such a small species, the species was very discreet, very secretive. So we had to use broomstick handles to find the turtles. As you can see, all these men are carrying broomsticks. And so we would go around in the dirt until we heard a clunk or in the wetlands until we heard a clunk noise. We had to reach our hands underneath the, the mud and see if we pulled up, hopefully a bog turtle. Um, and then after that, we would take their measurements and then um, basically we would attach radio transmitters to them so that we could see where they were going. So when the interns began, when the interns started, I showed them the exact same methods and I was able to see like, yes, you know, we can do the work as well. And it became fun. You know, we had a lot of things that we learned together that we weren't typically used to. But still, you know, I struggled and I ended up dropping out of my master's program and well, actually I started a doctoral program at Clemson University, decided to go to Clemson, and I ended up dropping out of both Clemson and Virginia Tech, um, just because I had a hard time with still feeling isolated. Um, my life took a little turn and I ended up becoming a mom and then a biology and earth science teacher. I took up three part-time jobs after teaching and I noticed that I kept finding my way back to biological and wildlife sciences. No matter what job I did, I found a way to teach children and others around me about the outdoors. So eventually one of my part-time jobs um, I stumbled across was, was with parks and recreation. And I started working in an outdoor camp and I was just blown. I was like, wow, you know, you can get paid to kayak, canoe, do archery, teach kids about kids about the outdoors. I loved it. Um, but however, at the time, those positions were only part-time positions. Um, I ended up landing a full-time position, position be, becoming a recreation specialist in youth and teens. After that, I found an outdoor programs position in the city of Chesapeake, fell in love with the job. So what does an outdoor recreation specialist do? Um, I do outdoor recreation, I do outdoor education, and I help, I do conservation uh -huh. efforts. So for example, with the recreation, I teach, I'm an archery instructor, I'm a canoe instructor. So I do, I teach, I teach archery, I do canoeing, canoeing, kayaking tours, hiking tours, and then like outdoor education, the topics are um, unlimited. So I can teach about butterflies, bees, mushroom foraging, edible plants, flowers, trees, you know, it's, there's so much, the outdoors is a great classroom. And then, you know, conservation efforts, teaching others how we can be great stewards of the land. I'm also a justice outside fellow. And basically our mission is to advance racial justice and equities and equity in the outdoors. We shift resources to build power with and center the voices and leadership of black, indigenous and people of color. So quick break. Um, I want you guys to either close your eyes or kind of just zone out. And we're gonna do this little mental exercise. And I want you to think about who you envision as I'm giving you these three different examples. So number one, you're at a local park and you see three park staff walking along the trail. The trail is covered in fog colored leaves. Two of the people are park rangers and the other is a park interpreter. Who was the first person you envisioned? I mean, who were the first people you envisioned? Number two, you're hiking along a trail within the George Washington and Jefferson National Forest. You pass by two people observing a millipede. 
What do those people look like in your mind? And lastly, it's the perfect day for fishing. You walk out to the pier and you see someone is already there casting the line. Who does your brain envision? Who did you see? Did you see male or females? What race did you see? What age? What do their bodies look like, their hair? So sometimes we have these biases, biases that exist in our mind without us realizing it. Um, and so part of my mission is to help people to realize that the outdoors are for everyone. So when I build my programs, often I think about, you know, how did I feel when I was in a situation where I saw um, there was nobody else like me? You know, how do I make people feel comfortable? How can I draw people to an outdoor env environment and they feel excited about it? They want to come back. They want to share with others. You know, how can I help them to remember what they learn? How can I support my community? Do my programs? Um, allow everybody to show up. So ways that I do that is, um, instead of just doing a canoe tour, I might give people water guns or water so soakers so that it becomes fun. Um, if I do a hiking tour at night, I give people uh, the glow stick necklaces. Um, if I do a sunset to moonlight tour, I do the same thing. I think of ways to kind of make it fun. Um, what else? When I do my marketing materials, I make sure that everybody is represented, you know, different ages, different colors, um, different ability levels. And when I do my programs, I think about, you know, what pace am I going at? Can everybody enjoy this, you know, enjoy what we're doing? And does everybody feel safe? I explain to them what safety measures I have in place. And then I think about success. What does success mean for me? And what does success mean for our community? Success to me means someone showed up, they had a first time experience and they loved it. They felt safe. They shared it with others and they come back. And so even though initially it took me a long time to accept that I dropped out of graduate school um, but I learned through that, through that experience um, why diversity is important. And so now, you know, I can look at all these pictures and I remember all these first time experiences for people and it sticks with me. And so I no longer feel like a failure. I can see how I'm making a difference. So I don't know if you guys saw Steve from Blue's Clues. He says, and then look at you. Look at all you've done and all you've accomplished. And then you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? And so that's part of reflecting back. Um, and I want to encourage you guys, when you guys go on your journey, be your true authentic self. Know that nobody can bring the same gifts that you bring. Now, the fun stuff. OK, so when the pandemic hit, I don't know about you guys, I was scared, okay? I stayed in my house. I didn't go grocery shopping for three months, okay? I started thinking about some crazy stuff, like how am I gonna survive this? I was watching those movies like the pandemic. I was setting up a campsite in my backyard, talking to my 3D targets. I was building natural shelters. I was eating clovers. And it had me thinking, what is there around me that I can eat? How can I survive? You know, can I build a fire? Can I build a shelter? Can I survive off of things in the wild? So I was thinking about edible plants and I ended up speaking to one of our master gardeners or master naturalists. And she um, told me about this app called Seek. If you're interested in learning what type of um, plants and animals are around you, this is a great app, it's a free app. Um, basically, you take a picture of the item, it lights up when it has a great um, view of the specimen, and it tells you what you're looking at. And usually, about 90% of the time, it's correct. So you might want to follow up. Um, 
But before I start talking about edible plants, I want to give you a couple of warnings. Um, you need to be mindful of poisonous lookalikes. Understand that it can be illegal to remove um, plants without permission, whether you're on pub public or private land. And when you take, you know, take with respect to the ecosystem, take just enough. So kutsu, this is a fun one. I don't know if you guys have driven on a highway and seen like mountains covered in greenery. Well, it's called kutsu and it's actually an invasive species for us, um, but it's made up of these three leaves and the leaves are comparable to like spinach. So you can cook them just like you can eat them raw or you can eat them cooked and those flowers they smell amazing. You can be walking down the trail and you can smell them. It's kind of like grapes. Lion's mane. This is a, a mushroom and this is a fun one. I actually had this one growing in my backyard and never knew it. So when you're outside looking at trees, I encourage you to look up. Um, it has hair, a hair-like appearance. It kind of resembles a lion's mane and it reminds me of like ponset and it holds flavor like that. Some people slice them and um, make like uh, patties out of them to put on sandwiches. And then we have all kinds of um, like wild onions. So it's garlic, there's scallions, things like that. Mulberries, this is often found in our parks. They resemble the look of blackberries, except they're in trees and they're a little bit sweeter. They're very tasty. Persimmons, we also have these in our park. Um, you only wanna eat them when they're ripe. So hopefully you can get to them before the animals do, because if you taste them while they're underripe, it's gonna dry your mouth out. It's pretty disgusting. And the purple passion flower, this is one that I newly discovered. Um, had no idea, I've been walking past these for the past three years and didn't realize it was the passion fruit. Dandelion amazes me. There's so many vitamins in dandelion. You pretty much can eat any part of the plant. Um, it's rich in vitamin A. Um, it's good for your skin. Um, it's also rich in vitamin C and vitamin K, which can help fight, fight off Alzheimer's disease. Pine trees, um, they're used for medicinal purposes. You can put them in your tea also strong in vitamin A and vitamin C. Sassafras, I remember this because it basically looks like a dinosaur foot. Um, sassafras was first used to make root beer. And then wood sorrel. So this can come in white, yellow, or like a pinkish purple color. Um, it kind of looks like a clover. And this plant is also edible. Chicken of the woods. This is another fun one. When you come across it, it's so exciting. It's like a bright orange color. It grows in clusters up the barks of tree and sometimes it's laying flat on like rotted wood. Um, it's pretty much comparable to chicken meat, which is why it's called chicken of the woods. Oyster mushrooms. This is another good one. Um, you can tell that you have an oyster mushroom because if you smell it, it kind of smells like licorice. And that's pretty much my presentation. Do you guys have any questions for me? All right, so our first uh, question for you is, what types of partnerships do you have in your position? So I work with different um, organizations within the community. Um, I work with master gardeners, master naturalists, beekeepers, astronomers, um, butterfly society, even like wildlife rescuers, things like that. These groups, um, they're like community volunteer-based groups and they love coming out, providing demonstrations. So it's great, you know, basically I don't have to know everything, but having connections with other people that can share and educate, that's what they do. All right, and then our next question is, uh, what is your typical work environment uh, like? 
Um, and maybe you can describe like a typical day in your position. Um, so I usually program on the weekends uh, because that's when most people like to hang out in the park. Um, I work at a park, well, different parks within the city. Um, a typical day could be uh, registering programs in the system. I, I pretty much build flyers to market. I help with our social media. Um, I keep a budget of all the supplies that I buy. Um, you know, and just coming up with programming ideas for each season, I have to create a timeline, create descriptions, things like that. All right, and then um, an, a question from the chat was, uh, what was one of the craziest things you've uh, seen while doing your job? Mm. Well, I don't know if I can call it crazy because I'm always excited when I see things um, like copperheads. Um, I've had coworkers that have spotted black bears. Um, then you have crazy situations where, you know, working in the parks, you never know who's in the park. So sometimes you run across some, some situations um, that are a little different, but that's pretty much it. And uh, we have a question um, uh, from somebody in the chat that is, uh, do you have, a, are you a part of any programs for people with uh, disabilities or uh, do you work with people with disabilities or anything like that? Yes. So in Parks and Recreation, we have a therapeutic specialist who specializes in working with people that have disabilities. Um, sometimes we partner together. Um, but yeah, we try to be inclusive for everybody. Um, and then we have another question. Uh, who was the major uh, role model that you look up to? Or uh, yeah, who, who was your like favorite role model? Honestly, I look at, there's a group of people. So social media is awesome. Instagram, I love following all my nature people. Um, people that are doing things in the outdoors. It keeps me um, inspired. Um, I learn from them and I don't know, it just keeps you going. All right, and then we have two more questions, I think. So the first one is, what would be the best advice you'd have for somebody that uh, might like to pursue in this field in the future? So with Parks and Recreation, um, we have different opportunities for people to volunteer. So I would suggest finding out which department you're interested in and signing up to become a volunteer. Um, if you're trying to get your foot in the door, kind of like what I had to do, I worked part-time until I was able to come across a full-time position um, and basically show, you know, what efforts you've made already to obtain that job, whether it's in athletics, aquatics, outdoor programs, things like that. All right, and then um, we have another question that is, uh, how do you manage the unexpected circumstances that come with your job? Um, I kind of accepted a long time ago with working in the outdoors, <clears throat> you never know what you're gonna come across. You don't know, so if I'm teaching, a camp, you know, it's kind of like you have to be okay with walking upon the unexpected and just realize there's so much you can learn. You can learn from the trees around you. You can learn from the animals. If there is certain what, like, let's say it rains, that doesn't mean we have to stay inside. What can we learn in the rain? Things like that. And I also learned that from my graduate research, we had to work around species and what they do, you know, not what we're used to doing, so. Um, and then we have um, a question that is, uh, what is like your favorite program uh, that you've been a part of um, and like to work with? Um, I really enjoyed doing a camp out where I partnered with REI. Um, it was pretty much made to where, 
anybody that didn't have any experience camping, canoeing, hiking, they could come to this program and we would teach them everything, how to build a fire, how to set up a tent. We even showed them different type of hiking boots, um, how to cook over a fire. And I just enjoyed it because I saw people of different ages and backgrounds come together in nature and they just had a great time. You know, they had a great time learning together and exploring together. All right. And then I think this might be the last one. So um, have you ever made like fancy dishes with the food you forged um, that you collect in the outdoors? So <laughs> I'm still kind of like, mm, I don't know if I want to taste this stuff yet, just because of like, you have to be very knowledgeable and careful when you're foraging. Um, I will taste things that I know for sure doesn't have any toxic lookalikes, like the lion's mane. I have done that, made it as a pond sit. Didn't really like it because you have to be careful in the way that you cook it. Um, but my goal is to learn how to forage and start using these things because the amount of vitamins these things have, that's free medicine. All right, thank you for those questions. Uh, well, thank you again, Ms. Bridgers, and thank you all for watching. I hope you were amazed by everything you learned today. We would also like to thank the museum's digital media team for helping us put on the cafe. Don't forget to follow Teen Science Cafe and mention us on Twitter, Facebook, and tag us on Instagram. Also, please check out our survey at tinyurl.com slash TSC survey 10. The survey will also be sent out in a follow-up email if you are unable to complete it right now. Once you complete the survey, you will receive a discount code for the museum store. Be sure to register and tune in for next month's cafe on Friday, November 5th with Dr. Terry Long to learn about plant and microbial biology. Thank you for joining tonight's Teen Science Cafe. Hit the subscribe button and the like button and make sure you turn on bell notifications to make sure you don't miss premium content from NCMNS. Don't forget about filling out the short survey after the cafe. My name is Rhea and these have been your cafe coordinators. Stay safe this October and have a spooky and eerie Halloween. We hope you have an enchanting autumn and can't wait to see you next month.